Good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much for your time and your extra effort to coming in here in person and virtually. I mean, especially in person because it's raining a lot outside. So thanks for your time and your effort. And I hope that more of you guys will be joining us here. So um, welcome to Education USA Indonesia Pre-Departure Orientation 2022. Congratulations to all of you guys, um, virtually and in person. Congrats for you, your success in getting letter of acceptance. Um, actually, most of you probably get more than one. So I'm really, really proud of you. As one of the Education USA advisor in Indonesia, I am very, very happy to be able to work with you or a lot of you guys here and i want to congratulate you and welcome you to this pre-departure orientation that we made for you every year and i want to welcome our special guests and speakers today um acting deputy chief of mission kyle ricardson thank you so much for coming in uh, mary Trishok, assistant cultural affairs officer Professor Nizam, Acting Director General for Higher Education, Research and Technology from the Ministry of Education, Culture, Research and Technology. Thank you for coming in. Dr. Rahmat Sriwijaya, Chair of ISMA, welcome. And also Ibu Rumtini from Indonesia Endowment Fund for Education, LPDP. Thank you so much for coming in. So, um, you know, we will have uh, three sessions today, and I will start with the opening remarks from our Acting Deputy Chief of Mission, Kaya Rickardson. Welcome. Selamat pagi. Pagi. Oh, pagi semua yang ada di Indonesia dan so, selamat malam semua yang ada di Amerika Serikat. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be with you here this morning to join you for the Education USA Pre-Departure Orientation. This program means a lot to me as someone who studied abroad two times during their student, uh, their higher education studies. So I know how you're feeling. Maybe a little bit nervous about going abroad to the United States, but hopefully this orientation will make you feel a little bit better. Today you're going to receive a wealth of information from our panelists to help you prepare for the next step in your educational journey. A special thank you to Professor Nizam, Acting Director General of Higher Education from the Ministry of Education, Culture, Research, and Technology. To Ying Cheng, Program Coordinator for International Programs at Colorado State University and to the students currently studying in the United States and alumni who are volunteering their time to be with us here today. First, I want to congratulate you all on your acceptance to colleges and universities in the United States. I know there's a lot of work that goes into that, uh, and you should be proud of the hard work that you've put in and the achievement of being accepted into American University. This upcoming journey will challenge you in new ways and may push you to try new things that you didn't think possible. I certainly didn't think that I would be able to learn Spanish before I went abroad to Ecuador when I was a student. But it's also going to be a journey that rewards you with new friends, new skills, and greater knowledge in your field of study. You will gain new perspectives on the United States, on Indonesia, and the world. And I urge you all to arrive on campus uh, with an open mind and eagerness to learn new and different things. Students are a university's lifeblood and the universities you attend will work hard to create an atmosphere that best helps you achieve your goals. Remember that you should study hard, but don't forget to enjoy the experiences outside the classroom, which are just as important, and as much a part of attending a U.S. university as the lectures and the homework. Volunteer at an organization on campus or in the local community, join a new club or intramural sports team, travel to a city in another state, Share stories about Indonesia with the Americans and other international students that you meet. During your studies, you all will be ambassadors of Indonesia to the United States. You will have opportunities to share Indonesia's rich culture, traditions, and history with your classmates, teachers, and communities. You can teach them about batik and buka puasa, about ole ole and indomie, about the 17,000 islands that make up Indonesia, 
their lives will be forever changed by their interactions with you. Tell them not only what is different, but what is also about the same between our two great nations. We have many similarities, and we're uniquely placed to learn from each other and to take advantage, uh, or I'm sorry, to take on the shared challenges from COVID-19 to combating pollution and climate change to fighting disinformation and upholding principles of good governance. And most importantly, we share democratic values and the incredible diversity of our populations brought together under the same motto in Indonesia, uh, Bineka Tungalika, and in the United States, E Pluribus Unum, which mean unity and diversity and out of many one. The strategic partnership between the United States and Indonesia is strong, and the future of that partnership is bright because we are building it together. The individual connections that you will make connecting our two peoples are the foundation upon which all other areas of our strategic partnership are built. You make that real, and you carry that forward. When you return to Indonesia, your skills will be highly sought after, and you will become part of the U.S. alumni family. When you come back, the role will be reversed, and you will be ambassadors for the United States here in Indonesia. Better able to explain our life, society, and culture, and education there to your family and friends here. We hope you have a positive experience and encourage others to follow in your footsteps. We look forward to getting to know you and working with you in the future. I wish you the best as you embark upon what will be an exciting and life-changing journey. Thank you very much. Good luck. Samoga success. And have a great trip. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Semangat pagi, salam sehat, salam sejahtera untuk kita semua. Good morning, Excellency Ambassador of the United States to Indonesia, His Excellency Sung Ye Kim, Miss Emily Yasmin Lewis, the Cultural Attaché of the United States Embassy in Jakarta, and my beloved students, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to congratulate all students who will be studying in the United States of America uh, this fall. I also would like to express my sincere appreciations for Excellency Ambassador and his staff at uh, the U.S. Embassy Jakarta for guiding and assisting our students to prepare for their uh, departure to study in the, in the United States from helping them to apply for the best colleges and universities, processing their visa and providing them with this pre-departure preparations. We are very grateful for that. I'm sure this will be uh, very useful for them, for our students to be able to start their study abroad more smoothly. These students, I believe you are going to enter colleges and universities in the United States of your choice, of your dreams. So your dream is about to come true. We know that education in the United States is among the best in the world. It will give you the best opportunity to learn and experience from the center of scientific and technological development. So don't miss the opportunity. You must remember to work hard and earn every opportunity you want. Take every challenge you face as an opportunity to develop your future. However, always remember to have a sense of humor in life. Only that will give you uh, through the tough time. Life is truly special and with patience and hard work, you will make responsible decisions for yourself, your family and for your country as well. Stay as passionate and driven as you are today. Keep achieving and reach great height with flying colors. Explore places, make friends, and be a good citizen. You are also the ambassador of your country. So tell your friends in America about Indonesia, about its rich diversity, culture, food, about its natural beauty, 
and friendly and smiling people who live uh, in Indonesia. I wish you all the best. Stay safe, stay healthy, and keep doing great and have fun. Thank you very much. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Morning. Thank you so much for the opening and the welcome, uh, welcoming remarks. Um, we all feel so encouraged to support all of you guys to go to the States. And without further ado, let's start the first session. We will have um, Ying Chen, Program De Coordinator for International Programs from Colorado State University um, for the International Student Orientation and Academic Preparation. We will prepare the presentation so that um, she can present you a very good brief of how you can. Oh, okay. Sorry, I forgot that we need to take pictures. Um, so I welcome all of you guys to take pictures maybe here and then um, in, in that side. So we, we do two sides. Which way first? Okay, so let's face this way. Don't worry, we'll get a picture with you too. Yes, after this. All right, let's turn the other side. Can we do like a selfie? Do you guys want to stand up? Yes, we can do that. I can take the picture from here too. All right, everybody. The first one is from the camera. Yep, you can squeeze in behind. One, two, three, to the camera, and one more from the phones. One more here. All right, that's great. Thank you, everybody. I was about to save that for the last, but let's do that first, right? All right. Now let's start with the first session. Uh, like I said, it will be International Student Orientation and Academic Preparation uh, from Ming Chen, our program coordinator, international programs from Colorado State University. Hello, everyone. Um, can you see me or hear me? Yes, we can hear you and the video will appear. There you go. Yes, we can see you. Hi. Hello. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Ying Chen. And first, I also want to congratulate, congratulate all of you to be admitted to the universities in the US. And I'm so glad to see so many of you both on site and on the Zoom to join the session. Um, so I work in the Office of International Programs at Colorado State University, and I feel very honored to be here to give a presentation about international student orientation and academic preparation. Um, I'm, I'm, um, yeah, I know a, a lot of you might probably be the first time to come to the United States and you may feel both excited and nervous at the same time. And I totally get what you're feeling because um, I feel the same when I first came to the United States to study um, about over 10 years ago from China. Um, and uh, now I would like to share some information and experience that might be beneficial for you to know before you head over to the US. So can you also see my presentation? Yes, we are currently pulling out the presentation and we can see it now. Okay, great. 
So um, you can go to the next slide um, to see the out outline. I have a lot to share with you today. So this is an outline for today's presentation. The first um, is about uh, people you need to know because you will need their help throughout your time in a, univer in a U.S. university. And then I will also help you explore some common helpful resources that most universities have and also touch base um, on some basic safety and legal reminders. And then finally, I will also talk about some tips about how to be a successful student in the U.S. Uh, and then we will have some time at the end for you to ask any questions. So now let's get started. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, so first we are going to talk about some people you, need, you really need to know. And then you can go to the next slide. Thank you. So first, you need to get to know the people in the International Student and Scholar Services at your university. Sometimes um, it has the acronym ISSS or OIS or OS, uh, OISS. They are like the home for our international students and scholars. You need to know where they are and how you can find them. They may have different advising options, for example, uh, working advising, advising by appointment, in person, or virtual advising. So figure out their advising options, hours, and locations. Then you can uh, talk with them when you need their help. The international student um, advisor and staff there can help you with um, all kinds of Im immigration or non-immigration related questions. For example, when you need um, to extend your program or change your program or transfer to a new school or travel outside of US to get a travel signature, use CPT to do internship off campus or use OPT to work after graduation, you all should talk with an um, international student advisor there. Um, if you bring your family or spouse with you, they also offer immigration support and do programs for them as well. And even sometimes you have something that you don't know who to talk to or you are worried about something or you don't uh, feel right about something, you have some financial problems or you need some help, the office is always there. And even if um, they don't know the answer directly, they can help uh, direct you to the right place or person. And besides dealing with um, in, um, immigration cases and answering questions, that office also does a lot of programs to help interact you with other international students and domestic students and uh, help build relationship and friendship among students. And also offer some um, short trips to help you explore some local fun things. So you definitely want to know the people in this great office. Um, Next slide, please. Here, I, I want, uh, want to touch, touch base a little bit on CPT and OPT, which you will need to work in the US. So CPT is the acronym um, of Curriculum Practical Training. It is a work authorization for F1 international students to receive further training that is directly related to your uh, degree and major. Um, those are some basic requirements uh, for students to apply for CPT. So first, you need to make sure your um, F1 status is active and valid. You should maintain your full-time um, enrollment. So for if you are an undergraduate student, you need to register at least 12 credits per semester. If you are a graduate student, you need to register at least nine credits per semester. And students must um, enroll um, for at least one academic year to be eligible for CPT. But if you are a graduate student, you may, if your major requires you to participate in CPT prior to the completion of one academic year, you may also be eligible to do that. And when you use CPT to work, you can work as part-time, which means um, up to 20 hours per week or full time, which means more than 20 hours per week. Please know that if, we, if you use 12 months of full time CPT, you will lose the eligibility for OPT. 
So OPT is post-completion optional practical training. It is a temporary employment authorization for international students who have recently completed their degree. You must work at least 20 hours per week and the work must be related to your major. You can apply for OPT in your final semester. The application window is from the 90 days before your graduation date till the 60 days after your graduation. Once it gets approved, you will get a work authorization card. It's called EAD, which will be good for one year. But if you are in STEM majors, you can extend your OPT for another two years. And there is a limit of um, unemployment days during your OPT. I'm not gonna go uh, going too deep into that for now since you're gonna just start your program there. But when you get to that point, you can talk with um, an international student advisor in your university. Next slide, please. Um, then you need to get to know your academic advisor, not just to get to know them, but also get connected with them as early as possible, because this person is your main resource for your academic study. So what does your academic advisor do? Uh, they can help a lot. They can help you understand your major requirement, uh, to help you register classes accordingly. They can provide advice when you want to change or add a major or add a minor. Uh, when you have academic difficulties, they will, um, they will also give support and connect you to additional resources. So if you look for opportunities to get involved with research or want to find an internship related to your major or want to um, have a study group or join an academic student group within the department, talk with your academic advisor. They will likely be able to give you some advice. It is recommended to meet with your academic advisor regularly. Um, I would suggest at least one to two times per semester, especially when you need uh, when you have any academic plan change. Um, so basically, people in the international students and scholar office and your academic advisor can almost cover your questions re regarding immigration status, concerns, or study. Um, if there are any questions that they cannot answer, again, they can help direct you to the right person or place. So it is wise to start talking with them if you have any questions or concerns. Next slide, please. So um, the second part, we're gonna um, explore some helpful resources. Um, um, and let's start with transportation. You can go to the next slide. Okay, thank you. So most universities have school buses that go around the campus and also in the city. It will be helpful if you can figure out the routes and the stops that are close to uh, where you live and where you need to go ahead of time, which will save you time and money and energy. And right now, a lot of uh, places, they have um, the app that you can download. So I'm sure you can find those information either from um, some current students or from the school website. Website. Um, and most cities will have a public transportation that may be available for students to use for free. So check with current students. I'm sure they will be happy to share some living tips, not only about transportation, but also other areas with you. Um, bike and scooter um, are widely used on campus right now for students to commute between classes and academic buildings. You can also choose to use Uber or Lyft or purchase a car to get you uh, to a destination further and faster. Um, if your university is in a big city like Seattle, Denver, New York, um, subway is also a good way um, to help you get around. Next slide, please. Yeah. Um, health insurance is required for all the international students. You can either purchase your own health insurance that meets the requirement from your, uni your university or use the insurance that is provided by your university. So if you are enrolled in a health insurance plan that is provided by the university, most academic um, services will be covered. Uh, I mean, medical services will be covered. 
When you feel sick uh, physically or mentally, don't wait to see a doctor. Please find out where the health center is located um, at your university and what alternatives around the campus if you need help outside of their business hours. Find out what services the health center provides. And when doctor there um, cannot help you with your situation, they can also refer you to a bigger hospital or um, specialty. So health um, is always the number one thing when you study abroad and health center is the place you should go when you are not feeling well. Next slide. Um, the main task for you, um, of course, to, is to study. Here are some academic support resources that most universities have. First is your academic advisor. As I mentioned before, they can connect um, you with any of your, uh, they can, um, you can contact them with any of your major questions or concerns. Second is your faculty in each course. I would encourage you to go to their office hours to ask questions about assignments, course content, or just chat with them, you know, to learn um, their achievements in, in the area, you're applying for the future, etc. Office hours is a good opportunity to leave good and deep impression on your faculty. So you may need recommendation letters from them um, in the future for you know, your further study or the job. And then that next is the writing uh, center. They can help review your academic paper to make sure the grammar, the format are correct. And tutoring center offers tutoring sessions for some specific courses so you can get extra help. Um, I would say this is especially helpful if you are an um, undergraduate student. Um, in, the, in the library, of course, you can find tons of academic books in the paper and also find study room for groups project or group study. And if you need additional academic support, you know who to ask, right? Um, yeah, so um, you can always ask your academic advisor. And next. Um, so the university in the U.S. Um, is um, like a small city. It has uh, most facilities and services that you need. Um, so, and the student center is like a hub with all kinds of student services. For example, at Colorado State University, our um, in our Lawrence Student Center, it has like restaurants, coffee shop, um, bank, career center, legal services, student organization. Um, offices, bookstore, student ID, um, office, theater, etc. And besides study, um, please set aside some time to work out at the university gym. Um, again, health is the uh, number one thing, so get sweat and stay healthy. Um, if you don't want to cook, you can purchase the meal plan. The dining halls in the, in the U.S. universities are mostly in buffet style with all kinds of options. So don't eat too much, but if you do, uh, you can always get some workout at the gym. Um, student organizations is a big part of the U.S. campus life, and uh, it is a great way to get involved with a group of students with similar interests or same major. There are usually several hundreds of student organizations in many universities. Like at CSU, we have over 400, 500 student organizations here. They are cat categorized by department, by sports, by interests, by countries, etc. So you are definitely find one or some that can satisfy your need. Um, I will encourage you to join at least one or two. Uh, what you will get from those organizations are not just network, but also used for resources and your personal development. And when it is time for you, oh, sorry. Um, yes. Um, when it is time for you to find campus, on-campus job, internship, full-time job, career um, center is the best resource for you to get that information. Um, they, um, they organize university career fair, also offer review and modify your resume, help you do mock interview to equip you to find a job. 
And at Colorado State University, we also have student legal services. They are campus lawyers to help students with any legal cases. Uh, for example, if you have any trouble with your leasing contract or if you get tickets from police, um, they, can, they can help you. Hopefully you won't run into any legal cases, but it is always good to know if the legal services is available at your, at your university when you need it. Um, next slide, please. So now I'm going to touch a little bit um, on safety and legal stuff. Uh, I'm not an expert, but would like to share some reminders with you. Just put some seed in your mind. And when you are not sure whether you should do it or not, hopefully you will remind Ao Ying from Colorado State University should, uh, with us that we should not do it. Otherwise, I might be in trouble. So we're going to talk about driving first. If you decide to purchase your own car and drive in the US, you need to get to uh, get those three things ready. Driver's license, car insurance, and the registration. You can get the driver's license and the registration at the local DMV. So DMV is Department of Motor Vehicles. And most campus will require uh, parking lim uh, permits because the space on campus is always limited. So make sure you find out if you need a parking permit or not before you park on campus. Campus. And do not drink and uh, drink and drive. If you are arrested uh, due to DUI, drive under their influence, it will cause severe consequences. Your visa might be canceled. You will get into lawsuits. So, um, so obviously, um, definitely do not do that. And do not um, text and drive. This is obviously very dangerous and can cause ac um, car accident. And next, um, smoking and the drinking alcohol are not allowed at Colorado State University, and I assume it is true for other universities as well. But if you are off campus, remember you must be 20 year old to have alcohol. This is the law, so it's very important. And then, next slide please. Um, so all the universities in the U.S. have campus police department. Uh, find, out to, find out your campus police phone number and save it on your phone just in case you need it. But if you have any emergencies, most of you should know um, to call 911 in the U.S. And if you live on campus, you might hear um, some uh, fire alarms sometimes and most of the time it might be just a fire drill um, however um, whenever you you hear it you need to leave the building as soon as possible and don't pull the um, alarm unless you see the fire and next slide please so most of you are at the dating age so I, I want to remind you that do not date anyone under the age of 18 and if someone say no to you do not text call email touch or follow them even they are your friends because if they take it seriously you may be in trouble um, and American people care about privacy and people respect that um, uh, so please do that as well. Um, and even when you meet with them, do not be too close to each other and leave enough space between. And I think this should not be a problem right now due to the COVID and nobody would like to be too close to, um, to the others anyway. So, but just keep that in mind. And then um, next, slide, next slide, please. So the final part is about how to be a successful student in the U.S. And then first, um, I would like to emphasize the email communications. I will suggest everybody here checking your, e your university email account every day. Um, all the important messages will be communicated to you through email. If your university has requirements for you to finish before your arrival, email will be the main channel to notify you. For example, there might be some uh, pre-arrival modules, placement tests, welcome event, signups, um, etc. So if you don't check your email often, you may miss lots of important information and requirements. And checking your email doesn't mean to make all the emails read. You need to actually read every email. And when you read emails that need your 
um, response or take actions, please, please do so within one to two days. Don't wait until last minute. Some actions are very time sensitive. If you don't take action in time, you will get into trouble. For example, if ISSS contact you to extend your I-20, you need to do that before your I-20 gets expired. Otherwise, you have to leave the U.S. Um, another advice, when you email someone in the university to ask questions, include your C, um, student ID number and your name in the email so they can check your information in the system and better help you. Next slide, please. Uh, when you need to meet with an advisor, either um, immigration advisor or academic advisor or counseling advisor or career advisor, there are usually two main options. The first one is called open advising or working advising or dropping hours. That means um, no appointment is needed. They will provide a certain period of time so you can just show up anytime in between with some short and quick questions, which can be solved in maybe five to 15 minutes. The second option is, um, is to make appointment, which means you need to schedule ahead of time with questions or conversations that require more time for uh, like 30 minutes. And then next slide, please. Um, there will be a lot of things going on when you study and live alone in a new country. So you need to handle things in different areas on your own. It will be wise to use a calendar like Google Calendar or Outlook Calendar to set up reminders for things like classes, assignment dues, meetings, activities, billing, payment due, all those kind of stuff. Calendar is a great tool to make things organized so you don't forget any important things. And in terms of um, number of hours, I always tell my students to use the credit number. They register time to time, three or 3.5 to see how many hours they need to uh, respond, uh, did they need to study. For example, for undergraduate students, if you register 15 credits, then you will need to spend about 45 hours per week on study. And for graduate students, you may want to time 3.5 to get your study hours. The hours include class hours, preparing time, homework, um, lab time, etc. As a full-time employee, we work at least 40 hours a week. So as a full-time student, you need to spend that about the same time on study as well. And when you arrive in the U.S., you will notice that you need to make appointment for many things. Um, people here like to schedule things ahead of time, so you will need to address yourself into that habit um, if you don't, uh, if you are not used to do that. And next slide, please. Okay. Um, so your health is the base to be a successful student. So make sure you eat on time, sleep on time, and uh, to use the gym to do some workout to maintain a healthy status. Um, and then next slide, please. And then when you get into a new environment, meet new people and make new friends uh, who will provide you a sense of belongings there. And I heard from some of my students um, that it is not easy to make new friends, um, but um, it will be easier if you open up yourself to meet, meet those people. So you actually have a lot of people that you can meet with, your classmates, people you meet at events or programs, or people you, uh, you join uh, the same students student group or your friends' friends. You, uh, you can meet with a lot of other international students and uh, who are like you, um, you know, um, studying a new environment or domestic students who are interested in your culture. So yeah, try to put yourself out there, throw yourself out there to meet those people and make friends. Next slide, please. And then though those are just um, um, study tips uh, I, uh, that I want to share with you. First is to attend class on time. Um, in the first week of, week of class, your professor will go through the syllabi with you and some class may count attendance as part of the grade. So pay attention to that. And then uh, make sure you complete your assignment by the due date. That's why it is important to set up some reminder on your calendar. Um, and then um, when you do any test test or assignment, make sure you understand the instructions correctly. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask questions to uh, your faculty or your advisor. They are always welcome your questions. 
Um, and then um, academic plagiarism is a very serious thing in the US, so don't ever copy anybody else's work. Otherwise, if your faculty report that to the student conduct, you might be dismissed if the situation is, um, is very critical. Next slide, please. So finally, um, I just wanted to share last two things that don't fall, fall under any categories, uh, but I really th uh, think those are a very important thing for you to know. The first is to remind you to pay attention to all kinds of scams. In the US, we um, students will get a lot of scams. So for example, phone calls from embassy from your home country or phone calls from USCIS to ask for your but passport information, address, social security number, bank information, don't, um, don't share those information over phone. And th those places, if they really need something from you, they won't call you. They will mail some official documents to you. And then the second thing, um, it, second um, is um, through email. So you might get email about like, um, oh, there, here is a job opportunity. You can earn 500 per week, or here's a um, link to get free gift card. Um, don't click, uh, click any of those links in this kind of suspicious email. Um, and then next one. So last thing is about tipping. So tipping is a common culture in the US. Is there a tipping culture in Indonesia? Um, I don't know. If not, um, it, it will be helpful for you to know those numbers so you can have um, an idea how much how much tip you need to pay in different places. So um, yeah, th this pretty much everything. Sorry, I sh I I spend um, more time. I I need to. So right now um, I'm open. I, I have one more um, slide. I think. Yeah, I, I really hope um, you can make your dreams come true in this new adventure in the US. So that's the end of my presentation. I hope um, it is helpful for you. And uh, right now I'm open um, if you have any questions for me. All right. Thank you so much, Ying Cheng, for your presentation. I find that really, really helpful. So as I have mentioned before, we will have three sections uh, for this pre-departure orientation and this is specifically for the academic life and campus life and in the part two or section two, we will talk about, you know, student life and everything with the uh, uh, current student and alumni. So um, we will try our best to, you know, section the types of questions accordingly. So um, we will take two questions from in-person audience and one question from the Zoom. So if you're in Zoom, what you need to do is just raise your hand in the Zoom and our um, technicians here will help us to select uh, the participants who wants to ask the question. So for in-person audience, do we have any question? You can raise your hand here and then you can stand up. We'll pass the microphone to you. Anyone have any questions for Ying Cheng or anything uh, that's generally, you know, concerns um, for your life in the campus? Anyone? Not yet? Okay, so maybe I'll start with my question first. Um, as a fellow alumni from um, United States, I find that a lot of this information are so relevant, but I want to emphasize that every university, every campus that you will attend will have an international student orientation on its own. So I want to highlight that you, as much as you could, you want to attend those because it is more detailed in terms of your area. like. The, the place that you will be studying, the city that you will stay in, it is much more specific. You can get, you know, like the directions on where to make the bank account, how to take the bus to here and there. So it's a lot more specific, tailored to where you will be studying. So as much as you can, attend them, um, even though it's only virtual if you, you know, if you like go after the orientation. 
All right, so far, any questions? No? Virtually, do we have virtual questions? Ada yang nanya di ini. Okay, so we okay. have one question yep. from Zoom. We will unmute you, and if you are comfortable with turning on your video, we will turn on the video, but if not, then you don't have to. Yeah, I saw, I saw one question there about the CPT, OPT. Oh, great. So um, again, I'm not an um, immigration advisor, but I do work um, in the International Student Scholar Service Office, and I was an international student myself. So um, based on what I understand is that on, um, only if one student can, can require CPT and OPT. Um, Let's see. I also heard from you that STEM graduates will have the opportunity to extend the work period. Oh yeah. So if your if your major, so if um, you can double check with your international student scholar um, advisor to see to make sure your major is eligible for the STEM extension, um, and that they they can if if your major is eligible, then you can do the extension after the first year of OPT, and then extend your OPT for another two years. Thank you so much for the question, Gabby, and thanks for the answer, Ying Cheng. So um, I want to add to uh, Ying Cheng's uh, answer here that the regulations for OPT, CPT will, you know, they could be, you know, revised and updated. So what you need to do is make sure you get the most updated information from your international student um, advisor or counselor in your campus, on your campus. And what you also, so right now, what we know as an Education ESA advisor is that you will uh, be able to try to get an extension of two years if you graduated from a STEM designated majors. But of course, because it's a request, it is of, uh, subject to the approval, right? And they have a set of process for that. And there's international student advice, uh, advisor in, on your campus to help you with that. And um, yeah, for J1 or F1 eligibility, you probably need to check uh, also with the advisor, but you can also ask this question on the third part of the uh, pre-departure orientation today because it will be about the visa and keeping your student visa alive, okay? I think we don't have more questions, do we? Okay, one more from the Zoom again. Okay, so one more from the Zoom. So is it from Nicholas? Devi. From Devi. Yeah. Okay. Devi, you can ask the question directly. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to ask questions. Uh, so I would like to ask um, about the additional questions for J1 visa. So I believe that uh, we can have uh, we can legally get a summer internship in US if, if there is a summer internship in the curriculum legally yes but I believe some employers would not really um, favor these options uh, they will not um, easily recruit the international students because uh, they tend to recruit people who will work for them uh, post study ever study. So for J1 people that needs to go back to their countries, it, it would be very hard for them to secure the summer internships. So uh, do you guys have any tips for international students that needs to go, needs to go back to their countries um, to securing the summer internship um, during their school programs? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, Ying Chang, if you don't mind, could I jump in a little bit on answering this question? So for J1 students, uh, assuming that you receive um, funding from scholarship or you know, uh, sponsored by your company or some sort of uh, other source of funding other than the self-funding, you probably need a permission first to be allowed to apply for jobs under the J-1 visa, regardless of uh, the employment uh, status and permission from the campus. Am I right, Ying Cheng? 
you actually know more than I do. So <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you so much. I, I mainly work with F1 students, so right. I don't really know the regulation for J J1. Exactly. So for J1, it is a bit special in a way that, yes, you kind of like bounded by kind of a contract to come back to Indonesia or any other country if you are originated not from Indonesia, um, meaning you will have to double check with your sponsor, um, you know, to, to double check, is it okay if I try to apply to work in this and that organization in this and that role? So that's the first thing that you need to do first. Um, sorry, what was it uh, Davina? Yes. Yes. Okay. So that's the first step that you need to check. And if you need further assistance, you are more than welcome to join uh, me, Santika, or Mas Iqbal, or any other advisor, education US advisors here in Indonesia. Okay. All right. Um, we are all set for the first part. I'm going to start the second part by inviting the moderator for the session two. Um, so it will be preparing for your departure from the current student and the alumni's point of view. I'm inviting our moderator for the part two, Mbak Mariam Konita, an LPDP alumna from NYU. Welcome to the stage. Uh, okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Can I see everyone? Okay, hello everyone. Hi. Okay, my name is Mariam and I'm going to moderate today's sessions, preparing for your uh, departure. I believe that being uh, prepared for your uh, studying to go to the United States is not only about uh, packing the right suitcase, but also you, know, you need to know some planning knowledge, process, and also some uh, practice. So, uh, my background is that I'm a content creator and also I'm uh, recently graduated from New York University. And I am glad to introduce our speakers. The first one will be Mas David, is there? Okay, he will join us virtually and our second speaker, Devina, can you? Okay. Okay, Mas David, he is um, currently a master student at the International Education Program uh, at the U University of Pennsylvania, and and Devina, she is uh, is my alumna. Okay. Um, okay, Mas David, can you please briefly introduce yourself? Okay. Can you hear my voice clearly? Yes, okay. we can hear you. Okay. okay, so good morning everyone in Indonesia. My name is David. I'm currently a student at the University of Pennsylvania Graduate School of Education, majoring in International Education Development. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank patient for all of you who made it so far, and then we'll depart into the U.S. soon. And a special shout out to my fellow Quackers, the new Quackers who will be going to the University of Pennsylvania. So we will be seeing each other very, very soon in campus. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so, uh, Devina, okay, sorry. Can you please briefly introduce uh, yourself and maybe your experience so that our audience can relate to? Yeah. All right. Hi, everyone. Good morning. My name is Navina. I'm currently a psychology student at the University of Indonesia. Last year, I got the opportunity to go to Boston University uh, with ISMA uh, as my scholarship. One of my highlights last year was to become a TEDx speaker at TEDxBU, which I talk about uh, methods on dealing with social comparison. And yes, that's basically about me. It's nice meeting you all here. Thank you. So, okay. Okay, so we only have a short period of time, uh, only about 30 until 40 minutes. So we want to uh, ask you your full attention. And we are going to break this session into two chunks, two distinct chunks. The first one, I, as a moderator, will 
as a few correct equations for our speakers. And the second one, uh, maybe the questions will come from you, the audience. So let's get right into our first questions for our speakers. Okay, um, uh, maybe start from Devina. Okay. What are the most anticipated things before departing to the study to study in the United States? Okay. Um, for me, uh, one of the most anticipated things was. Uh, it's very important to be healthy first because last year before I departed to the U.S., I was sick. So especially you guys are departing really soon for this fall semester. So I hope that you are going to stay healthy, drink lots of vitamins because it really helps you. Um, it's really it's really sad if you can't go when you're sick. So uh, that's definitely the first step. And then the second one is to prepare for your packing. I guess it is important because uh, me, myself, I tend to overpack as well last year because I bring lots of stuff. And when I was there in the U.S., I didn't use any of those stuff. So basically, um, you need to list down the things that you need to do, uh, the things that you need to bring, sorry. And then the third one is to prepare all your documents, especially when you're going to, to the customs. Uh, the customs officers are going to ask you about how much cash do you bring? And then uh, are your documents are all ready? What is your purpose to come to the U.S.? So definitely those questions are the things that you need to answer. Answer. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I agree with that, especially about the essential documents and not to be overpacked. Um, okay, uh, can we go to Mr. David? Uh, yeah. Okay. Sure. So, what do you think are the, the most important things that we need to prepare before departing to the United States? I think you have to prepare to be ready to study. As someone like me who have been professionally working for more than 10 years after my graduation in undergrad, so it's very hard to get back to the school. And so preparing your mind to face the academic and non-academic challenges is the most important thing for me. So in terms of academic things, um, you have to find out about the course structure you will take from the current students or alumni. And also you have uh, to be prepared for lots of reading assignments. That's really, really challenging for me uh, and the first semester because so many, so many reading that I have to read every day to be prepared for the, the next session of the class. And as for the non-academic things, I think you have to know yourself better in terms of coping with the stress. And also if you have any medical concerns, you should address or other conditions that will hinder your academic success. Okay, thank you. That's a great point because I also faced academic shock when I first arrived in the United States. Um, do you have any suggestions how to handle the problem? Um, the academic things? Do you yeah, know? the academic uh, shock, the academic shock. Because I believe so that I the academic, with, like yeah. the climate, I mean, the system is very different from Indonesia. Yeah, so I spent time to talk with my academic advisor at the campus and then and then uh, told my academic advisor that I'm from Indonesia, my background is there, this is my study culture in Indonesia, so I need time to adjust things to the new environment and then uh, just practice, practice, I mean like to read and also write academically and then uh, try to uh, talk with other students, also international students or current students about how to uh, adjust to the uh, American classroom uh, environment. Yeah, I agree. I think uh, you need to, I mean, you need to use the uh, academic office, uh, post office hours with the academic advisors uh, because you will be very beneficial with uh, with the advising, with the advisor, and yeah, that's that's really helpful. How about you? Do you have any suggestions? I mean, advice for us if we face like academic ad academical challenge or something like that. Okay, for me, I think it is really okay to ask for help because a lot of people might say, okay, I, I got this, I got this, but turns out that you need help and then it's okay to ask for help, you know. Uh, you have your academic advisors, you have uh, psychological uh, services and they provide it for free in the campuses, in most campuses. So I think that um, when you're asking for help, you also 
are helping yourself. So I think that's my answer for the question. Okay. So uh, Devina, are there any regrets? Like I should have prepared this and that uh, so that our audience could anticipate it before they uh, go to the st go study in the United States. Okay. Um, for me, I feel like uh, looking back on my experiences, I don't have any regrets uh, because before coming to the U.S., I know what I'm going to do there. So I have this goal of exploring myself, finding yeah. finding my identity, and um, making new friends, making new connections. And with that goal in mind, I have all the actions. So when I was there in the U.S., I find uh, a lot of networking with uh, graduate students from Indonesia, and then I also um, take part in organizations. I volunteer. Uh, in the U.S. as well. So having the goal in, in mind, having the sense of, okay, what I'm going to do in the U.S., it's really helpful because you're not going to get lost with all the things that are going, uh, that are happening at once. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Mas David, I would like to ask you a okay. question regarding the packing list. Um, <laughs> do you have any suggestions about what items uh, to pack and not to pack? Yeah, I think one of my regrets is I'm packing, I bring too many stuff from Indonesia, which I do not use actually in the US. So basically, I mean, like, you don't need to bring so many clothes uh, to the US because you can buy it here. And then also uh, in terms of the food, uh, because in Philadelphia, there are so many Indonesian restaurants and groceries. I can very easy to uh, buy Indomie, buy ketchup manis, ABC or something like that in the Indonesian grocery stores. So yeah, so one thing is regarding the uh, pick, uh, how to pack is do not bring too many things to the US. Just bring the, ne the necessary things and you can uh, just assume that you need uh like um, a daily use product for one week and then after that you can buy it in, in in the us so basically you have to uh bring your particular medication because maybe the uh, the the medicine here uh, maybe not um not okay with your body for example like in here we don't have panadol uh, they have paracetamol, but paracetamol is different than Panadol. So I, I always ask my friend who coming from Indonesia to be to Philly to bring Panadol with me. And also tolak uh, uh, angin because uh, there is no tolak angin over here. So just like a particular medication that, that, that you uh, always use in Indonesia, maybe you can bring that to the US. And also, um, I think that's that's it. Okay, thank you so much. How about your experience? Sorry, for me, um, I think one of the essential things was to bring souvenirs from Indonesia. That was what I bring when I was uh, in the U.S. So uh, I brought like small uh, pencil cases uh, with batik. And then when I gave it to my international friends and my American friends as well, they feel like, oh my God, what is this? So I feel like having, having the souvenirs, you can also introduce the culture of Indonesia and the uh, art. So yeah, I think it is very essential. And then also the medicine, I think uh, according to Mas David, it is also something that is very different. They have like different paracetamol. So yeah, I always bring my medication from Indonesia. Okay, thank you. Actually about the medicine, um, the paracetamol, I think they have different different brand, but the, the oh, sorry. The composition is the same. So if we check, uh, the composition is basically the same and it works well for me. I don't know, maybe. <laughs> okay, so, um, so it can be very tempting to overpack, right? So how do you resist the urge to, I mean, okay, you, over, you, you say that you overpack back then, but from your experience, uh, what can be, what could be done differently uh, to resist the urge to overpack? 
for me, it's about listing down all these things because uh, going for like a semester or more, it's going to be different uh, from your only packing for your holiday for like 10 days. So I think it is necessary to like bring all the necessary clothes. And, and then as Mas David also said, you can buy some stuff oh. in the US, right? And then if buying clothes is, might be too expensive for some people, you can just buy it in secondhand stores and they have like good qualities as well. So I think listing down and yeah, just just try not to overpack because if you're flying in economy, you have like 30 kilos of baggage limit, right? So yeah, pay attention to that one. Okay. Uh, okay, Mas David. Okay. Uh, yes. I think you said a lot about how to not overpack. Do you have any other suggestions? Uh, maybe do not pack to capacity. Because I mean, like, I mean, uh, if you have 23 kilos uh, for one uh, baggage, you can just just pack for maybe 20. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. And then, um, and then bring that in a smaller bag because, and then it will be uh, reduce your temptation to bring many stuff. Okay. Like leave some empty space in your seat case, something okay. like that. Okay. Yes. Sorry. I think I have one more suggestion is for uh, you guys departing to the US, you need to check with the TSA website because they have some things that uh, the prohibited items that you can't bring, especially such as like Indomie, the chicken flavor, something like that. They're going to, the customs are going to check. And then, yeah, so basically check the TSA website. Okay. Um... Okay, this is one of the most critical issue. So when I was uh, when I was first arriving in the United States, I realized that my SIM card, I mean my phone, was not suitable for a US SIM card. And I said that this is very critical because we constantly, you know, con uh, interact with technology. And some international students, many international s students, said that they have faced the same thing. Have you experienced it or maybe you know how to handle the problem? Um, according uh, regarding the SIM cards, I think uh, in the US there are several brands, uh, big names. Uh, you can just Google it up. I'm not sure if I can say any brands right here. But uh, if your phone is not compatible to any SIM card, you can try to look for other brands because uh, I think most, most, I think if one, uh, seller company, your phone is not compatible to one seller company, then you can try the other company. So okay. you can just look it up. And they have different packages, uh, package plans as well. So uh, you need to find which is the fastest one, which is the cheapest one. So definitely do your research. <laughs> okay. Uh, Mas David. Okay. Uh, yeah. I will try to drop a link in the chat uh, in Zoom. Uh, but for every everyone, uh, in person, so you basically you can just Google, and uh, there are two uh, major brands in the US is AT&T and T Mobile. So you can just Google AT&T compatible phone, and then uh, you can find the list of the the phones that can be uh, used for the AT&T or T Mobile. Okay, thank you so much. So actually, I bought this phone when I first arrived in the US because my phone was not compatible. So yeah, because it is very critical. It is very important uh, since you, you need to communicate with uh, you know your your family and probably the accommodations. So yeah, so maybe you can Google as um, Mr. Mas David said. And okay, the next question is. So when you arrive uh, in the United States, what are the most important thing that you need to do first? When you first arrive in the US, um, after you, uh, I mean, uh, pass through the US customs, and after you, uh, after you arrive at the university? Okay, when I first arrived at the university, uh, my experience, I, I arrived in Boston around late at night at about 12 p.m. So um, I had to unpack. I I was super tired to unpack because it was it was the flight was too long, and then I decided just to sleep. But then it was a mistake because I forgot 
to take the PCR test. So I, I overslept. And then, so I think it is important for you when you come to the dorm, you need to unpack first and then settle everything, no matter how late you are in the dorm, because uh, yeah, it's going to mess up your whole schedule, I, I feel like. So uh, when you first arrive, um, you need to uh, settle with everything, uh, settle your dorms and meeting your roommates for the first time. And then after that, you can do basically your uh, agenda. So uh, for me back then, it was my PCR test. But then again, um, you need to be excited when you first arrive in the US, I feel like, because uh, I know it was tiring, but yeah, you're in the US. So when, it was a fun experience because when I landed in the US, I actually cried because, <laughs> because uh, I didn't imagine myself going to the US, especially I told you that I was sick right at the oh, time. So. Yeah. I was, I thought of myself, oh my God, I feel so grateful with this opportunity. So I think it, it motivates me to, okay. Uh, when, when I was late for my PCR test, I was like, okay, I, I need to uh, schedule everything for now. So that's what I do. It's okay. become very scheduled. <laughs> Thank you. Mas David, how about you? Okay. So the first thing is find your housing. Make sure you already got your accommodation for, <laughs> for that day you arrive in the US. <laughs> And, uh, and then the second thing is get your U.S. number, the phone number, uh, in order to open the uh, U.S. bank account. Because it, because if you go to uh, open your bank account, they will ask for your U.S. number. Uh, and also take your campus ID card because it is the access to uh, to many resources in the in in your uh, campus. And also make sure you already get the email from the campus and then you can access all the library resources online and offline. And also make sure that you have already registered for the class for the fall semesters. And then attend the orientation and networking event, especially on the first weeks uh, after your departure to the US. Okay, uh, regarding the accommodation, since I believe that for graduate students, we need to find our own accommodations in advance because maybe the dorm is only for undergrad or for exchange students uh, so maybe um, mr david must david can you please share experience and maybe share some tips how to find the best accommodations actually there are several resources to that you can you could choose when searching for accommodation the first is you can use the on-campus or off-campus housing sites from the university website. And also you can join the Facebook group or Facebook marketplace. And in Facebook group, you can just say that uh, Philadelphia, uh, for example, Philadelphia housing or Philadelphia list, uh, something like that in, in, in Facebook. And then you can join the group. Uh, also you can talk with other departing students and also current students or alumni. And also, you can talk to your Fermias chapter. Okay, thank you. How about your experience when you are uh, trying to find the accommodations? Um, so last year, I was uh, in... Oh, sorry. It was me or for yeah, me? Yeah, sorry. Devina. Oh, I'm so sorry, must have been. <laughs> um, uh, for me, last year, I was yeah, in the right. dorm at the VU dorm. So uh, I got everything settled. It was, uh, I heard that most of ISMA students right now, uh, you all use like off-campus housing, but it is also a good opportunity. But last year I was in the dorm. So I get to meet a lot of international friends and have, um, okay. and yeah, that was, uh, so I, I didn't have to do a lot because I just need to pay to, to the school. Okay. So, um, must David said that we need to open a bank account in the United States. So regarding the finance uh, for international students um, and regarding uh, to create bank accounts, how long does it make and uh, how to create bank account? Do you have any uh, suggestions? Yeah, based on my experience, so basically you can go to the bank and then you ask them that you want to create a student bank account because the student bank, uh, student account is like different than the regular one. Like for me, like uh, I'm using PNC Bank right now. They have a student account with a, a free monthly fee, uh, and that's uh, that, that's one of the benefit by opening the student account. Also, if you go to Bank of America, for example, they are free, but you have to maintain at least fifteen hundred dollars every month in your account. 
and basically you can just go to the to the bank and then bring your passport uh, you show them your i20 or the s2019 for the j1 student and uh, you, if you already have the id card uh, student id card you can also show them uh, to open the bank account okay thank you so i think i would like to jump in maybe when we first arrive or maybe when we uh so maybe before we create a bank account, maybe we can check the university's website and uh, check whether they have collaborated with some banks. So it will be easier for us to reach the bank because it will be near to the campus and we can open the bank account in that, uh, in that, uh, in that bank. So how about your experience? Yes, yeah, so when I was in Boston, uh, there are several uh, close by banks, but I, so I open, uh, same as Mas David, I also opened a student account because they don't have the monthly fees. Uh, my experience, I use Chase and it is very, um, I think it's very tech savvy because everything is integrated to your Apple Pay with just using your, uh, what is it, your iWatch or your Apple, you can just uh, put your phone and then you can pay everything. So I think it is very, I was I was shocked when I would see that. I was like, oh my God, this is so convenient. I wish I, they had it in Indonesia. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree with that. But it can be very tricky as well because when you, because it is very convenient, sometimes you do not feel pain when you buy something very expensive, right? Yes, you don't feel guilty. So you just like <laughs> tap your phone and then there you go, your money. A wash away. <laughs> okay, so how about uh, managing finance when you are a student? How do you manage finance? Okay, for me, uh, especially when you are you're coming to the U.S. with a scholarship, you have limited resources, uh, unless that you have your parents who who you can call like dad, please send me some money, whatever. So um, I think when you have those limited resources, I I feel it is very important to jot down what what you need to do with your money. So for me, uh, my financial goal was to uh, use it for experience, uh, and then I tend to uh, spend my money on experiences such as doing this, doing that. But for some of my friends, they tend to use the money for, okay, I want to get uh, better housing or I want to uh, purchase some tech products and everything. So having that goal, it really puts you in the mindset of, okay, I'm spending it mindfully. So having that goal and then listing down so you don't overspend with your money. Okay, I think that is thank you so much. Uh, Mas David, how about you? Uh, about, do you have some tips regarding managing uh, finance as a student and what to be, what will be prepared and anticipated? Yeah, as an LPDP scholarship recipient, uh, we have limited uh, monthly allowance. Shout out to Ibu Rumtini. Hi, Ibu. Uh, <laughs> so we have to be very mindful in using the money. Uh, so we cannot eat, I mean, like uh, regularly in the restaurant every day. So, we, uh, so what I usually uh, do is going to groceries and then cook in my home and then go outside, uh, eating outside maybe once a week, every weekend. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so I would like to ask one last question. Um, what are the campus facilities that are very rewarding to be used? So maybe do you have any suggestions when you maybe when you have experience education in the United States, maybe you realize that this campus facilities is very uh, is very underrated and very rewarding for international students to use. For me, uh, this is the first presentation. Uh, they said that they have the resources center for when you uh, have trouble with your essays or do you want to learn new skills? They have tutors and that is a very uh, good resource. But I want to highlight because I like working out. So I find the campus gyms, you really need to go to the campus gyms because um, I feel like, in, especially in Boston, uh, there is a three, three floor gyms that they have like uh, all those machines. I thought like, this is a mall or is this a fitness place? or is it a campus? So I was shocked. And then also I can join classes for free. So they have this uh, wait, sports class they, 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 that you can get for credit. I joined like figure skating, like gymnastics. It was super fun, especially all those um, sports were really expensive in Indonesia, right? So you can really try it out when you're uh, in the US. And yeah, I really like the 
uh, working uh, the sports facilities. That was really great. Okay, thank you. How about Mas David? Do you have any experience? I agree. Yeah, I agree with Devin now. I really like the gym in the campus. I usually go swimming uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a KSM center. And also the Cadet Center is also a good facilities because you can ask for the advisor to review your essay, your CV, your uh, CP, or resume, and the cover letter when you apply for the for the job. And also the Writing Center if you have, if you have difficulty. And also the library uh, because we can ask the library staff to find the data for our research or our assignment actually. Uh, also, I go to the student health service. So since I already pay the uh, health insurance, I, I I go to the student health service for getting the immunizations. So and also I I join the religion club in the campus. For example, if you're a Christian or a Muslim, there are there are there are religion club there, and also the uh, student body. And also, like uh, I'm from Indonesia, so I joined also the Indonesian club, also an Asian club. They have many events, and then they have many events with free foods. That's really important <laughs> for some for someone uh, under the scholarship. The, the the event with the free foods is the best one. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> they provide a lot of foods, especially Indonesian foods. If you join Indonesian community, so. I agree with that as well. You can get like, because uh, if you want to get some like Indonesian food in Boston, they sell it for like $10 for like nasi kuning. It's so expensive. So if you go to this event, you can get those for free. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, thank you so much for Devina and Mas David. And okay, well, now we have come to the Q&A sessions. So we have like maybe two uh, maybe we will have two questions from the offline audience and maybe we will be asking also one question or we will be asking one from the virtual audience. Okay. okay. So please stand up and uh, you can mention your name or okay. maybe destination university. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Mariam, for the opportunity. My name is Lionel Tim Linardo. I'm a student representative uh, of ESMA UPenn 2022. So I actually have two questions, one for each speaker. But first of all, I want to thank you so much for the sharing session because it was so much fun and so informative to hear all of your experience. So my first question is to Ka Devina. Uh, as a fellow ISMA awardee, I'm pretty sure that uh, you already realized that we have more responsibility when we arrive over there. Because we are not only a scholarship uh, uh, receiver, but we also uh, serve as an ambassador for Indonesian culture and heritage, and we have to hold a cultural events. And what I want to ask is, is there any specific things that we have to watch out for when we are holding an event, such as maybe getting a permit, or maybe there is a specific thing that we need to look out for? Uh, maybe that's my first question. Should I wait or proceed with my second one? Uh, maybe you can go to the second. Uh, ah, okay. Uh, so my second question is to uh, Mas David. Uh, first of all, I want to say uh, it was such an awesome experience listening to you because uh, I'm also looking forward to pursue my uh, master education <laughs> uh, in uh, foreign countries such as United States. And I think it's really cool to be able to study in an Ivy League school. So what I want to ask is, uh, could you give us a tips or maybe a glimpse of your journey in applying for an Ivy League university for your master or graduate degree? So maybe that's my question. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Okay, Devina, can you, oh, okay, you can answer the question. All right, thank you. Uh, your name was? Lion, thank you so much, Lion, for the question. Um, for me, um, there are a lot of ISMA challenges that you need to do when you're in uh, the US, but it was super fun, especially when you're holding like cultural challenges. You want to introduce Indonesia culture to uh, international students as well as American students. So um, I think the key is collaboration. So you can, for example, if you're holding, if you're planning to host an event in the school's uh, facility, you can ask for uh, the coordinators to. Uh, to uh, whether whether the place is available, so you can have collaborations with your advisors, your international uh, officers, as well as you can have the collaboration with Indonesian student communities. So uh, if you're going to Penn, I think the Indonesian uh, Indonesian Association is called 
Pencaksila. Yeah, so you can uh, ask them about ask them about uh, how to hold events here. So yeah, basically it's about collaboration and contacting the international officers as well as the Indonesian communities. Yeah. Thank you. Is that answer your questions? Okay. Good. Okay, uh, Mas David. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's Pancasila is the Indonesian uh, Student Association uh, in uh, University of Pennsylvania. So answering your second questions is uh, everyone can have a dream to to uh, study in Ivy League University, not only Ivy League but U.S. University in general. So uh, what I did is I just dream big, but not only dreaming, but I I try to fulfill my dream. I also never imagined to be able to study here. So uh, the first thing that you have to do is building your portfolio, you got your experience, and then finding your uh, true motivation. Why do you want to study education, uh, especially in the US? Uh, and, then, and then you create a motivation ladder and then you, you put all of that in your motivation ladder. And then, and then that's it, just apply and then uh, just do your best to fulfill your dream. And, and I think I also uh, took some courage to apply for LPDP. This is also for the, uh, that's also a very challenging process, but uh, as long as you are uh, committed and motivated, uh, I believe you can do it. We can talk more later uh, when you arrive in Japan. Okay, thank you so much. So. Is there any questions from the Zoom? No, okay. Okay. So Okay. So is there any one last questions, one quick questions from the audience? Okay, one last and quick questions from that side. Sorry. Okay. Um, hello, uh, fellow speakers and um, teammates. Uh, my name is Edgar. I have the question regarding the SIM card. So, um, since our Indonesian SIM card would not work abroad, um, we were wondering, um, will there be any issue regarding um, using the internet from the airport to contact, uh, more importantly, our housing? And the second question is more about the Indonesian food, uh, more specific, specifically in, uh, Indomie. Um, so, what flavor of yes, I'm sorry. What flavor of Indomie can, can we bring? So, soto rendang. <laughs> and one more uh, for um, Indonesian snacks. So, will there be a problem for bringing like kusuka? Or <laughs> that's my question. Thank you. <laughs> um, Arizona. Arizona. You'll, you'll be able to get. Oh, do like Okay, so uh, maybe Devina, you can answer. All right. Uh, so the first question, Angar, is about the SIM card. Uh, how are you going to contact uh, the people, especially when you first arrive in the U.S.? So my experience was uh, when I was there, the first week I still use my Indonesian uh, card. So I have this roaming service from the cellular company so for about a week it's when you adjust with your uh, surroundings when you when you are there so you're still able to even though it's pretty expensive but it's so much better rather than when you arrive in the u.s and it's late at night and you don't find any like cellular uh cellular places that are still open so that's for the first question and for the second one about the indomie i wasn't sure um uh, what flavors are uh I mean, you can buy Indomies there, but it's just like expensive because you're paying with dollars, right? So uh, I, I feel that you need to check with the TSA website. Um, and then about the snacks as well, I think mostly, mostly it's about the, like having like chicken, 
chicken seasoning or chicken flavor, but uh, I think you need to check with the TSA website. Okay, thank you so much. Okay. Oh, it's a all right, okay. <laughs> okay, you got your answer, Angga. No, no fresh meat, but Indomie is okay. okay. Yes. <laughs> and if, if you cold, uh, you, you don't want to... <laughs> you don't want to bring the one with the English version that says chicken. Because if, you know, the immigration read it, it will be like, you know, um, confis confiscated. But if not, you're good. All right, um, we can get two more questions. Okay, one more, uh, two more questions. Okay, from that side. Yes. Hi, um, my name is Maria, and I have uh, actually two questions. Uh, first, I would like to know what are what were the things that you wish you knew before you arrived, and the second question is, have you ever like witnessed a crime in the United States? Sorry, can you please uh, repeat the first question? What did you wish you knew before you arrived in the United States? Okay, okay, I got it. Okay, so maybe you can answer the questions. All right, I was hoping Mas David would uh, okay. answer first. <laughs> okay, maybe Mas David, can you please uh, give your uh, maybe some insight what you need to know before uh, before you go to the united states uh, maybe not about academic i don't regret um for the academic things maybe for non-academic is maybe i will apply for canada, canada visa while in indonesia <laughs> because <laughs> because right now the waiting time for applying for canada visa in the u.s is more than 70 days. So that's what I regret. <laughs> okay. So actually I applied Canadian visa when I was in the uh, United States and it, it only took like several days or two weeks, something like that. Maybe it's, so, so I think the procedure yeah, is Yeah, right now it's, right now it's took longer time because of the COVID. <laughs> oh, okay, I got it, okay. Oh, maybe a reminder. I think this question wouldn't be for Isma Wardis because you are you are not going to be allowed to travel to different countries. Okay. <laughs> okay so. Uh, okay, regarding the second questions about the crime, right? Uh, okay. Okay. The crime. Uh, I saw it. I saw it once. I think in the train, and then. Uh, I know it's, it's the right thing or not, so I run from the the, the scene. So I go to another uh, another uh, uh, another train and then I exit in the nearest exit when I when I saw that. Okay, thank you so much. And how uh, do you have any suggestions like for students? Uh, for international students, how to keep make ourselves safe when we studying in the US? I think uh, you have to know yourself better, and then do not uh, go in in the night alone, for example. Or you know that certain area there there are so many uh, crime in the past. So so make sure that uh, uh, you go to the uh, more. Uh, to the place with more people and also uh, practice your self-protections and so if you if you feel that you are unsafe uh, you can call some someone and also if you are feeling threatened you can call 911 okay thank you how about Devina do you have any experience or any suggestions when we face the crime or uh, yeah, I agree with Ms. David, uh, especially at night, if you feel unsafe and you're walking in campus. Uh, uh, I, I'm not sure other universities, but I, I think they have the same thing uh, in Boston, uh, in BU particularly, they have this blue box. So when you're walking alone at night and you feel unsafe, so you can just call someone from the police department of the campus and then they're going to escort you to your dorm or to anywhere. So uh, if you're feeling unsafe when you're walking, you can just uh, 
contact them. Uh, and then I feel like uh, America is basically a relatively safe city. Uh, so you have to be careful, but not too careful that you lock yourself in your room every day. So <laughs> it's better to be aware of your surroundings, you know, take care of your belongings. And yeah, that's basically what I would say with the safety tips. Yeah, I agree. I think America is relatively safe. Uh, I, I, is, I mean, when I experience, when I have experience uh, some international conferences, I feel like American people are very nice and they're very, uh, provide us with a lot of, uh, you know, yes, they provide, us with, uh, they provide us with a lot of helps when we find like discriminations or something like that. But relatively, when I ask a lot of uh, people I know when I, when I was studying in the US, they said that they rarely face discriminations. Uh, they rarely face discrimination. So yeah, so do not overthink or maybe do not overthink that, oh, okay, I cannot, like, I cannot go outside because it's not very safe out there. No, that, that's not right. It's relatively safe. And okay, so uh, my experience is that when I was studying, you can also download an app and why you has an app that we can only open the app and contact the campus police. So whenever, wherever we go, we can always call the police, the campus police, or we can call 911. Okay, well maybe and one last question. Two, two from the Zoom. Okay. So we have two questions from the Zoom. Um, Satu, hello. There you go. Rana. Yeah, hello. Can you uh, hear my voice? Yes. Okay. Uh, I have a... I have a question for the speakers. So I would like to know uh, your experiences regarding the uh, housemate. So do you have like any tips for us uh, when you have an international housemate, like uh, they are from different countries, like how do you communicate with them? And is there anything that you need to consider? Okay, Devina, can you answer the question? Okay, sure. Um, when I was in BU, I was placed in a dorm with two other students. They were both uh, from America. So uh, language is not a barrier. Uh, but um, I think one of the tips was to be an assertive communicator because um, if you, uh, because one of my roommates, she, like, she likes to put her stuff in my side of the room. So I feel, sometimes I feel like, okay, you weren't supposed to do that, but I didn't say anything. And she thought that it was okay. So I think when you become assertive and I started talking to her, like, I don't like when you put your stuff in my side of the room. So then she started to understand, okay, I know it bothers you and I won't do it again. So rather than not talking about it and just letting it go, people won't understand, right? Yeah. Uh, you need to be assertive because in Indonesia, we're used to when we say no, people keeps offering us, right? When you say, do you still want some food? And then you say, no, oh, just, just have this, just have this. But in America, it's not like that. When you say, do you want this? And then you say, no, then they're not going to offer you anymore. So I feel that becoming an assertive communicator is important when you're having your roommates. Okay, thank you. Mas David, do you have any other experience? Uh, in my experience, because I live with other Indonesians, I don't really have many challenges. But I experienced uh, when I was uh, searching for the housemate in the first place, I, I actually opened for every opportunities. And mostly if you, if you live with people with, uh, from another country, uh, they will have like an interview, somewhat interview uh, to, to figure out your cleaning habit. Uh, if, you, if you like to have a party in, the, in home, uh, what time uh, do you sleep and also are you uh, LGBTQ friendly or something like that and then if you can, uh, have a habit bringing people to uh, sleep over in your uh, room or something like that so so in some cases they will have like an interview for for finding a roommate okay thank you so much so I hope that answer your questions so maybe we can have one more questions from the Zoom. Uh, hi. Hello. Hello, I can hear uh, your voice. Yeah, okay. Uh, I would like to ask uh, David, if I'm not mistaken, you are receiving the government uh, funding, right? Okay, so what I want to ask is, uh, could you please share your experience on uh, or advice or any tips uh, about the tuition payment or 
living allowance and insurance because uh, um, I heard uh, some comments from the seniors that for living allowance we need to like um, pay uh, some bills in advance because um, uh, we need to like uh, have a re reimbursement uh, date on 16th or 17th perhaps in ev uh, every single month and if you arrive prior to that you need to like paying uh, your expense in advance by your own self first um, is that correct and if it's um, if you have any kind of tips uh, regarding the fundings from the government uh, please do share some in general and additional questions is um, for all of the speakers um, do you have any recommendations for the the stuff that we need, we need to bring uh, from Indonesia prior um, our departure to US, um, for example, electronics or uh, anything that would be uh, helpful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mas David, can you uh, answer the questions? Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. So before your departure, actually, you can. Uh, um, as for one, uh, the half of the uh, settlement allowance, um, and then when you arrive in the U.S., you can ask for the the other half, and then asking for the living allowance. So, so yeah, in some cases, uh, there might be a case that you have to use your own money first to cover for your first uh, like two weeks in the U.S. But I think you have to really utilize the the settlement allowance that the, the half settlement allowance that you can apply before your departure. And in, regarding the insurance, uh, so LPDP will cover all the insurance costs at cost as long as it's built from the university. And regarding the tuition fee, uh, right now the mechanism is so for every semester. Uh, I have to ask the LPDP sending email uh, to the invoice.lpdp uh, email. So in about two to three weeks, they will send it to the uh, university uh, account. So not to our uh, bank account directly. Okay, thank you so much. So I think we are getting close to the end of our time together and if i have one last question if there is one last statement that our audience that uh, our audience to take away from these stations what would it be i would like to ask devina okay, oh, okay. all right so uh to all uh, of the students who are departing to the u.s uh, this fall semester i hope that you're having a great time because uh, going to the u.s is going to be i think it was one of the most memorable uh, moments that i have in my life so i wish that you can all do the same uh don't be afraid to try new things uh, try to make as many friends as possible because the networking is super valuable and then um, other than studying hard and then achieving your goals, basically um, try, to, try to become the best version of yourself when you are there and you can uh, contribute back to Indonesia when you finally come back home. Okay, yeah. thank you so much. Mas David, please give me your one last statement. Okay. Uh, I think as Kyle already mentioned in his remarks earlier, uh, do not only study hard, but also experience America. I think that's also what Ibu Rumpini said to me before I depart to the U.S. that David, jangan cuma belajar, tapi juga explore America. So yeah, try to experience new things, uh, see, uh, travel to many states in the U.S. and then also travel to nearby, nearby countries if you can. Okay, thank you so much, Mas David. So um, thank you for. Uh, our speakers and thank you for the audience for the active participations so i hope after these sessions you will end up with high quality preparations that sets you up for uh, your best possible study abroad experience um so yeah after this session we will have uh, regarding the legal issue to study in the us and i will hand over the stage to Christina, maybe. Okay, thank you so much.
Hi everyone, my name is Christina. I am one of the education uh, USA advisor based in Jakarta, like Santika and Iqbal. And I will be the moderator for the third session. Here we have Mr. Suli, the visa counselor. He will be the speaker for the third session. And he will talk about visa and maintaining uh, its status. Mr. Suli, the stage is yours. Hello, I'm Rena Bitter. I'm the Assistant Secretary of State for the Bureau of Consular Affairs, and I'm here to encourage you to study in the USA. There are currently 7,500 Indonesian students studying in the United States, and the US Embassy in Jakarta consular officers and Education USA advisors are here to support you and your dreams of joining them. If you're interested in studying at one of the 4,700 institutions of higher learning in the USA, you should start by contacting our partner organization, Education USA, which has six offices around the country, each ready to assist you. Each center offers no-cost services to Indonesian students looking for more information on study opportunities, scholarships, and more. The United States has remained open and welcoming to international students throughout the global COVID-19 pandemic. Our mission and commitment to promoting education in the USA and facilitating cultural exchanges has not wavered. We remain ready to participate in making your dreams of studying in the United States come true. Okay, Salamat Siang, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. Um, it's nice to have an in-person. I've been doing this for the past two years virtually, so it's nice to have it back in person. Uh, Namasaya Paksuli, and I am a consular officer at the U.S. Embassy in Jakarta. I'm here to talk about visas. Um, that was our big boss and at the State Department for the visa. And um, we have a presentation for you all, but I know this is a mixture. Um, so we will have time for questions and um, for you guys to ask me. Um, yeah, maybe we can get started. Uh, but thank you so much for your interest in wanting to study in the United States. Uh, for us, this is we're very excited and we're very happy that Indonesians are taking this uh, opportunity to go visit the US and pursue their academic careers. So thank you. All right, so we'll start with the presentation, and again, we'll have time for Q&A. Uh, uh, the whole process starts with coming to the embassy and applying for a student visa. Uh, we'd like to simplify the visa process for, for Indonesians. Uh, in this case, um, you know, to apply for a student visa, you need to look for a school that's certified um, and apply. Once you apply and get accepted to that program, you will apply for a visa to come and meet with a consul officer like myself for, a, for an interview. Um, usually when you're accepted, the schools will give you a document. It's a very important document that we will ask for you to have on hand. It's called an I-20. Um, during your interview, you will bring your passport and go through the process and meet with an officer uh, for an interview. What the interview looks like or what it is, you will be nervous and that's normal, but all the officer wants to know is if you have a plan to go. They will ask you about what's your interest, why did you pick that institution that you wanna go study at, and um, usually it's pretty straightforward who's going to pay for it, or how you'll pay for it, and uh, yeah. Next, please. Uh, I mentioned what to bring to, your, to the interview. Your passport is important. The I-20, the original document that's usually signed by, by the institution, and any financial documents. Um, you don't have to bring them, but it helps on your interview to, to bring them. Uh, you know, you can talk about scholarships. The officer will ask you about how will you pay for this program. 
if it's LPD pay, you can say I have a government scholarship. If your parents are paying for it, you can say, you know, my parents. They may ask about what do your parents do for work. So just be prepared to answer basic questions about how you will um, cover the school tuitions. Um, we'll go to the next, please. Uh, here in Indonesia, the visa reciprocity fee, uh, this is once you're approved for a U.S. visa, a student visa, you're asked uh, to pay a reciprocity fee. The reciprocity fee for Indonesia is $220. Um, again, you only pay this fee once your visa is approved. And uh, once your interview is done, you go, you pay the fee, and then uh, you will exit the embassy. Uh, all of this information is on our website, travel.state.gov. Um, you can find everything in detail. So for processing, um, we, we ask students, or in, in general, all visa applicants to, be, to apply as early as possible. Uh, the current wait time for a U.S. visa is about 64 days. Uh, so for then that that includes F1. So we ask you to please, if you're planning to go, apply early. Um, of course, you know we do take in consideration when things are uh, when it needs to be expedited, but those are um, handled uh, separately. Uh, some important information as far as when visas can be issued. It has to be 120 days before the. Uh, before your classes start, and that's the date on the I-20. Um, and you can enter the U.S. before, uh, up to 30 days before the start date. Uh, for most of you all, your parents or your family members may apply to accompany you. They will need to apply for a B-1, B-2 tourist visa. And again, apply early. Uh, the wait time is about um, almost two months. Uh, being prepared is important for all visas, including F1 um, student visas. If you are not prepared, you may be denied a visa. Um, if the officer feels that he or she, um, uh, if you're not able to prove to them that you don't have solid academic plans, you may be denied a visa. And that is common. It happens. So please be prepared. Uh, Yeah, we can go, that'll, that'll come later. Uh, traveling to the, to the United States, uh, it's important that you bring your passport. Um, that starts from the embassy onto the plane and then onto point of entry when, wherever you land in the U.S. Uh, keep those documents handy. Uh, one one uh, acronym or person that you'll hear a lot is your DSO, and that's the designated uh, school official, I think. Um, but basically, this person, every institution has a point of contact that you need to get familiar with and become friends with, and they will help you as your journey, whether you're studying a bachelor's or a master's, but every school has a point of contact, and they're there to help you, all international students. Uh, yeah, so once you enter the U.S., you go to the school, please reach out to the, uh, the point of contact, and it's known as the DSO, Designated School Official, I believe, yep. Okay, so as service, um, th this is an important um, uh, number. And there's a fee to it, but basically the service is a, is a way that our government is, tracks international students uh, while they're pursuing their academics in the United States. Uh, this is your entry and exit. It monitors your participation while you're in the U.S. So if you're a part-time, if you're there for full-time, you're part-time, that can uh, be problematic for you later. Um, so it's important that you're maintaining your full-time student status while you're in the U.S. Um, yeah, we can continue. The service is key. It tracks you so that once you leave and later you apply for a visa, we're able to see and 
again, it could be problematic if you're not um, doing what. Uh, maintaining your student status, uh, this is important. So once you travel to the U.S., please make sure you get there uh, no more than 30 days before your program starts. Again, contact your school official, known as the DSO. Um, reach out to them in advance. It always helps when they know that when they when they have and uh, when they know when you're coming. Um, attend your classes. Uh, have you know try to maintain your full-time status. Uh, if you have any difficulties or any problems, or you're going through family situations. The school official, the DSO, is the person you need to talk to. Uh, life happens. Indonesia is very far from the U.S., but you're not alone. You have a lot of help, and you may, but you need to let them know. Um, and if you're interested in wanting to work, I have had a lot of applicants to say, "Can I work?" It all starts with that person, the point of contact, the DSO. You're you're allowed to work, but you, there's a procedure for it, and they're able to best advise you. Um, without, do not do something that you don't know, or and usually it's working. Students they feel like they can go work to make additional um, income. If you don't do it without authorization, that's going to be problematic for you later. So please get to know your school official. I think we can go to the next one. Uh, so we have had applicants who transferred. This is common. Usually folks go to a community college, then transfer to a four-year school. Um, after that, do the OPT or go into a master's. Um, maintaining your status is important. Um, w uh, still attending your classes while your transfer is being uh, is in, in progress, you need to... Uh, yeah, please attend your classes. Uh, if Again, if you're not sure or you have questions, um, be in touch with the school official. Um, how to transfer the steps are you need to get accepted first. Um, again, be in touch with your uh, DSO. You need to have confirmation to the school or the institution you're transferring to. Um, yeah, that's okay. Some Q and A's. Uh... Can we go to the next slide, please? All right, thank you. Okay, how do we want to do this? Are you? question is, I have already arrived in the United States. I want to transfer to a new school. I have not yet started classes at the school listed on my form I-20. So as a visa counselor, what, would you do, what do you propose the student to do? Yeah, again, uh, please, uh, uh, anything regarding that, uh, stay in touch with the DSO at, at your campus, at your, at your school. Um, sh you know, just show proof of your acceptance that you are, you have been uh, admitted to the new school and uh, report that new school and be a full-time uh, student once you transfer. Uh, regarding service fee, again, your point of contact, all of this done is on campus through the DSO. What about the visa? Because some people actually go to college first and then they transfer to a uni uh, university. Do they need a new visa or they can use the same visa? So the visa is, once you're approved for a visa, the visa is good for five years with multiple entries. Uh, uh, as long as you're in a full-time academic uh, program, you don't need to worry about your visa. The visa is good. Uh, once you're done with your program, you must depart the U.S come back and your visa is um, terminated. 
So no, you don't need to renew your visa if you're transferring to a different school. I see. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Uh, so this slide is about wanting to work or can I work while I'm in the U.S. Uh, you are allowed to work in the U.S., but with permission. And it all starts with uh, USCIS. That's the United States Citizen and Immigration Services. Uh, you need to get work authorization before you can work, and you can work as a part-time. Uh, this process, you know, you'll need to go through the DSO at your campus. Um, but, yeah, once you're approved, you may work as a part-time while you're in the U.S. Usually, it's very common that folks do this, and then once they graduate, they go through a program called OPT. Uh, but again, you need you, you would need to apply for a social security number, and get an approval letter um, on the I-20. So please, please, please take that seriously because if you don't go through the proper route later on, it could be very problematic once you're exiting and wanting to return back to the U.S. as a tourist business. Um, yeah. Actually, for OPT, is it something that's free or you need to register and pay for some fees in order to have OPT? Yeah, it's done through the campuses. It's, uh, I mean, every campus, they have their own mechanism. Um, I did my associate's degree at a community college. I transferred to a public school, did my bachelor's while I was working. But again, for international students, it's completely different. And then for my master's, I, I studied at a private school and. Uh, but every school that I went to, uh, community college had a different mechanism. A public, uh, a public college for year had a different mechanism. And then private schools have their own. So uh, you would need to um, look that up through your institution because every school have a different mechanism. I see. Right. On the next slide. So after you finish your, um, uh, your studies, you have 60 days on your I-20 to return to the U.S. Um, a lot of times we have had folks who need to depart, but they have their belongings. You know, if you're planning to go for a bachelor's, that's four years of your life. You're going to have stuff in the U.S. You're going to, whether it's clothes, furniture, please leave and then apply again and go back as a tourist. You know, you can certainly go back as a tourist and handle that stuff, um, but don't overstay once you're done with your student visa. Um, so once you graduate, you have 60 days, take care of business, and if you need additional time, leave and then come back, apply for a tourist visa. That visa is good for up to five years, and as a tourist, you can go um, and take care of whatever that needs to be done, whether it's closing off a lease or taking care of furniture, um, you can certainly do that on a B1, B2 tourist visa. On to the next slide. Right, so we have another FAQ. The first one is how long can I stay in the United States? Uh, that visa is good for five years, but you can stay as long as you're in a full-time status. So as long as you're studying, you're maintaining, you know, you're, you're going to class, you're, you're okay. Once you're done with your studies, once you graduate, you have 60 days, you must depart. So the visa. Now, if your visa is expired while you're in the U.S., you can, stay as, you can still be in the U.S., but once you leave, you know, you come to visit your parents and wanting to go back, but you will need to apply for a, another visa because you can't enter the U.S. on expired visa. I think that follows up. My visa is expiring soon. Can I still? So as long as it's not expired, yes, you may. But once it's expired and you depart, you must apply for a new visa to return. And that's the same procedure. You will apply again, pay the reciprocity fee, and go through the same process to return back to continue your studies. Okay, so... Um, a lot happens once you decide, you know, the, it's a journey, this is not a trip, you're going, you're going to make new friends, you're going to have a, you're going to get exposed to life in different ways, um, just like we come here and work. Um, so the, the actions, you know, the things that you do will have a positive or negative impact in your life uh, once you're done with your studies. Uh, 
shoplifting, drug usage, uh, drinking, um, and overstaying uh, your visa or working without uh, authorization could all be problematic and later jeopardize um, uh, for your uh, of wanting to return back to the United States, whether it's for business pleasure or uh, you know if you want to go back do a PhD. Uh, so please, please be mindful of what you do because that stuff is on your record and it continues. It doesn't go away. Um, I think I'll stop here and give you guys the time to ask me um, any questions. Thank you. Okay, so now we are open for Q&A session. Do we have any question? Yes, <laughs> go ahead. On the left side. We'll start from the left side. We have hands. Yes, we have three hands. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Habira. I'm uh, Isma Wardi to UC Davis. Uh, my question is regarding uh, last year, uh, the Isma Awardees gets like a, a sudden tax form uh, documents that they have to send back to the U.S. Uh, I just want to ask if we do get, you know, such a sudden uh, document that we have to maybe send back to the U.S., will we get any help? Uh, maybe we can contact the U.S. Embassy in, here in Indonesia or do we just send the document back to you know the respective uh maybe like consulate or something thank you uh thank you if i understand your question uh correctly you said so if you get a document for the the scholarship document from your government will uh, the no. u.s embassy help uh, no uh it's more. yeah uh, the tax form tax form from the U.S. government that uh, do not, uh, the govern Indonesian government do not know about it because they, they just get the sudden document asked from the U.S. government that get, they get when they go back to Indonesia. Yeah, so no, the, uh, the consular section is not able to assist with that process. Uh, you would want to reach out to the school Okay, so, um, so we asked the DSO in our yes, respect. Okay, okay yes. thank you. Thank you, good question. One more at the back, two more at the back. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Good afternoon, I'm Fitria. Uh, I'm a Fulbright awardee. And I'm just uh, wondering how long the visa will be issued after someone get yellow card? Yeah, and and what can we do uh, uh, when we wait for the visa issue? Yeah, because uh, you know, last time I got a yellow card and it's already a month, and there is no uh, replay from the uh, from the uh, uh, from the office that maybe I should provide another information because I already sent all the answer like the officer asked. But there's no replay, yeah. Okay. Thank you, and congratulations as a, being a Fulbright. Uh, to answer your question, so once applicants are interviewed and approved for a visa, it usually takes two to three business days for us to process that visa. Um, so we take, uh, students are important to us, and we do what we can to make sure that it's processed and immediately so you guys can uh, plan accordingly to start your app. Uh, education in the US. Um, there are times when things when we need additional information, but that's case by case. And uh, the council section will be in touch with those uh, if if additional information is needed. Uh, but for those who got a yellow card for how long we need to wait sometimes normally, or the maximum? <laughs> Uh, what's the yellow card? Oh, what is like uh, refused? Not ref not entirely refused, but undergoing uh, additional information. Two two one G. Yeah, so that's what I was talking about. Additional information. Uh, there's no 
we don't. Uh, it's case by case. Um, yeah, it could take it could take up to ninety days. It could take up to a week. Uh, but that's um, it. All depends. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Let's go. Sure. One more. Yes, thank you for this opportunity. First of all, I'm Fiercia. I'll be taking master degree at the University of Washington, starting hopefully this early September. Um, actually, last Friday, um, two two weeks ago, I was applying for F1 student visa, and I used the official passport. Unfortunately, I was rejected under section 221G. Maybe we, I have the same case, the yellow slip. Actually, the yellow slip uh, stated that <coughs> um, my visa application has been rejected under section 221G. Um, actually, the officer said that I don't need to worry because it's only pending administrative procedure. I have sent some additional personal information, but I have no um, received any confirmation email from the embassy. Um, so the co my concern is maybe many of my friends here is how long that pending additional administrative procedure approximately will be just approximately if you can say the range of um, duration we have to wait because we are starting our class early September. And then the second question is, do you have any tips for us or any, stu uh, or any future student to prevent us getting that yellow slip? Thank you. Thank you. Um, regarding the yellow document that, uh, that officers hand um, after your interview, so this is all case by case. Um, I'm, not, I'm not able to discuss the details of it, but it's additional information that we require from applicants. Again, it's case by case, and that information is not processed at the embassy. It's usually sent to Washington, D.C., reviewed. It takes time. Uh, we're not able to, you know, people are curious, and we understand as officers that people need to make plans. Uh, you know, it can be uh, frustrating, um, and we are aware of that. We do what we can to make sure that students are taken care of because you guys are taking the chance to study in the United States. Um, so we're aware of this, but again, uh, the yellow slip, it is by law, it's rejected, meaning that we need time to review the application. And every one of you have, a, you know, you have your own life, you have your own family. It all depends, uh, but that information, it requires times to review. Um, and if the officer indicates that you have nothing to worry about, please don't worry about it. It's, it's just, it takes time for us to uh, make sure that we have everything we need before we can uh, continue with that application. As far as tips to be prepared, um, you all have started uh, of wanting to, it starts with you. You have done, you know, as long as you come to the embassy prepared, you will be nervous, that's okay, officers aware, but, uh, you know, the website, um, my tip would be to get used to the website, travel.state.gov, and there's lots of information on there, um, and our website, uh, U.S. Embassy in Jakarta. Um, but, yeah, that's, that's all I've got. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can we add one more in-person um, question and then two, three Zoom questions? Will that be okay? Thank you. Um, hello, I'm Aula, uh, LPDP awardee for PhD. I'm going to push my PhD in instructional technology at uh, Columbia University this coming spring. Uh, spring. Uh, my questions, I have two questions. The first one, I did my master at Lehigh University, Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, under USAID with a G1 visa. So the first question is, would it be possible to change my status from G1 to F1? And then the second question is, 
as PhD student, I'm planning to bring my uh, family, my wife, and also uh, my future son. So, um, so do I need to prepare any deposit on my bank account? Because I heard several news from my friends and also on the internet that we should have the certain amount of money on our account to get the visa for our dependents. So, as a PDP awardee, meaning that our expenses at the U.S. will be fully covered by the sponsor, but do we need to have a certain uh, or amount of money on our account to get the visa for our dependents? Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, you know, all of this, it depends. You know, you, have, you don't need to worry about your interview of, you know, your family wanting to join you. Um, we are aware of that. It's very normal that, you know, folks who go on to pursue PhDs, their, you know, um, family members, wife, kids, it's normal for them to join. Uh, you know, officers may ask you a question, you know, where will your a partner live or how will you cover your expenses? Just be prepared to answer very basic questions. Um, but I wouldn't be too worried about, you don't need to have additional documents on hand to prove that, you know, how you'll take care of. As long as you have a plan and you're able to explain, um, you know, interviews do not take long. Um, so, yeah, that's. And regarding your uh, question, uh, changing from J1 to F1, it depends, uh, you know, if, this is up to the school, so if you're applying, they go through the process of a J-1, it's normal. Uh, but changing it at the embassy, uh, you know, you'll have to reach out to us. Um, but, yeah, usually PhDs, you know, you can go to PhD pursue on an F-1 or a J-1. Um, I don't have the details on that right now, but please, uh, you know, we can share that exactly. I, uh, I know the change does not happen at the embassy. You will have to go to the institution and they'll give you documents because they're two different forms for I-20 is for F-1. And I can't remember what the document is called for a J-1, but they're two different forms. DS-2019, thank you. So DS-2019 is for the J-1. Okay, so we have three questions from Zoom. The first one is from Nicholas. He is currently in process in getting all the required documents, including service passport and after that the S2019. But those documents might be ready one week before the departure dates. Is there any way to expedite the visa process so that he can attend the first class in time? Uh, there is a way to expedite. You know, you will have to go through the website. Um, for on your interview date, we prefer original documents. Uh, in this case, a lot of this is case by case. Uh, officer may continue with the interview, but later on, so your case may be put on hold until you provide the original DS 2019. That's the document that the officer signs and dates. Uh, so you, you technically, you will not be issued until we have the original DS 2019 or I-20. So copies will not work. We need original documents. All right, on to the second question from Bill Haki. Um, this one is about J-1 visa. His J-1 visa is only valid for one year, but the program is 1.5 years. So he wants to travel outside U.S. after the visa expiry period. Can he still go back to U.S.? Yeah, so regarding J-1s, uh, you would need to reapply to return back. The, that visa is good for uh, 12 months. You would need to exit, reapply, and then go back to finish off um, internship or um, studies. I see. Okay, on to the next one from Nina. My son has F-1 visa from the university, but he may be deferring his starting semester due to unforeseen family issue. May I know what are the steps to keeping the visa status? Uh, again, great question. Uh, family matters. You know, it happens. Uh, you would, in this case, you would need to stay in touch with the DSO. Uh, and then the visa, if you're issued a visa, that visa is valid for five years. But the school needs to be aware of your status. Uh, so as long as the visa is active, you're allowed to go. It's multiple entries, so you may exit, 
and go back. But the visa is good as long as you're maintaining a full-time status. Okay. So as but the key thing is the school needs to be aware of your status, not the U.S. Embassy. Mm, and see. that's done through the DSO. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Suli. All right. I think that's it. We are done with the third session. All right. Thank you so much and good luck. I'm giving back the stage to Santika. Thank you so much, everybody. So um, it's always been like that. So every year, our pre-departure orientation always get heated up during the visa council section. So thanks, Mr. Suli, for taking all of the hard questions on visa. What I can share about my personal experience when I apply for my student visa back then it was very smooth and everything, right? So my only tips for you is make sure that you complete everything that's being asked in the form, whether that's DS-160 or DS-2019. Whatever form you have to fill, whatever things that makes you feel safer, more confident during the interview, just bring them. Whether or not you will use them during the interview, that's like the you know, uh, later problem, so you don't have to really overthink it. Um, a lot of my advices actually came in to share their anxiety <laughs> on, you know, like uh, visa interview and everything. And basically, it's like um, you just need to be able to answer the questions regarding your, um, your purpose of going to the States. So if you really going as a student, you don't have to be scared of anything. You just need to bring all of the documents that's being asked. For the yellow slip, I know it's uh, tricky because there's no you know, exact time frame that's given. But as long as you have given the extra additional information requested, just be patient and um, we are here if you need someone to talk to. And there's also an email address that you can follow up with through the visa council, so don't worry too much. If you have urgent needs, meaning your class or your you know, program will start and you haven't got your student visa, there are a few, a few things that we can do and that's for us to discuss in private in the one-on-one you know, -on -one uh, advising session. So find your Education USA center that's closest to you and the advisor. We are here to address those concerns if you have any. If we don't have the answer, we will redirect you to the place that you can find answers, okay? So don't worry and I want to thank all of you who are joining us in person and online again. And before um, I'm closing this annual event from Education USA Indonesia, I want to thank everybody, including uh, those of you who probably are here, but you haven't got any uh, acceptance letter or anything. Uh, you are in the right place, and you just need to push through so that you can be part of the successful students this year, like just like this year. So we do this every year, right? All right, so we wish you the best for your journey in the United States and great, great success in everything that you will do. Uh, we look forward to be reconnected with you in any ways possible. Once you are back to Indonesia or even when you are in the States, feel free to reach out to us if you have any idea to collaborate, all right? So I'm closing the Education USA Indonesia Pre-Departure Orientation 2022 and Please enjoy some um, snacks or refreshments that's provided outside of here. Thanks, everybody. See you next time. Terima kasih.